Okay, hello everybody. Um, I'm Austin with the School of Cities and I'd like to welcome you to today's session of Knowledge Cafe featuring uh, Professor Karen Kuby. Before we begin, I just wanna start with a land acknowledgement. Um, I acknowledge that the land on which the University of Toronto operates is the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit and continues to be the, the gathering place of many indigenous, Métis and Inuit peoples from across Turtle Island. As we hear about housing justice today, it's important to consider the damaging histories of colonialism that have brought about many of these issues. We hope that today's discussion will encourage all of us to critically consider these histories and how we may go about alleviating them. Knowledge Cafe is brought to you by the School of Cities, the University of Toronto's multidisciplinary center for urban research, education, and engagement, dedicated to discovering new ways for cities and the residents to thrive. The Knowledge Cafe is a monthly speaking opportunity for members of the tri-campus community at U of T to present insights and highlights of their research on a theme that is important and relevant to urban environments. It provides a platform for faculty, students, and researchers who are working to uncover students, uncover solutions to creating more just, equitable, sustainable, and prosperous cities. Today's Session Knowledge Cafe features Karen Kuby, um, associate or assistant, sorry, one of the two, a professor of, at the John H. Daniels of Faculty, Architecture, Landscape, and Design. Karen is an urbanist specializing in housing design and social justice. She is the editor of Housing as Intervention, Architecture Towards Social Equity, and served as the first executive director of the Institute for Public Architecture in New York. Holding degrees in architecture from the University of California, Berkeley, and the Columbia University Graduate School for Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, Karen began her, design, her career as a designer of below market housing. Before we begin, I just want to cover some Zoom housekeeping rules. As a reminder, the today's session will be recorded. We ask all attendees to keep their mics on mute during the presentation and only turn on at the end for the question period. However, we encourage all participants to put any questions you may have in the chat throughout the, the, the presentation. They'll be collected and addressed at the end. And finally, please practice good etiquette. People demonstrating inappropriate language or behavior will be removed. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand today's session over to Karen. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Austin. It's a true honor to be able to present um, in the School of Cities Forum. You know, when you're reading the, the mission about working toward just and equitable cities, I'm thinking about how much your work um, overlaps with mine. So it's really a pleasure. And thank you, Austin. You've been, you've been excellent in this whole process to get this together. Um, maybe before I'll start, I start, I'll just say I'm new. Um, I'm new in Toronto, I'm new in Canada, I'm new at the University of Toronto. I arrived in January after a 20 year career, mostly in New York. So it means a lot to me that all of you came today and I am in the process of meeting a lot of people who do work that's aligned with um, what I do. I see on here is is Alex, who's who I just met, who has, you know, who's doing really important engaged work. And I see Jewel on the line, you know, she's she's doing human rights work that's that's related to mine. So I hope to meet many more of you um, today and in the coming months. So thank you for coming. This means a lot to me. Um, so housing as intervention, architecture towards social equity. Um, I also want to thank you. Um, Austin uh, sent to me really excellent questions that you all um, gave as, as you were signing up for this. And so they were so good that I decided to address them directly through the talk. So you'll be seeing uh, blue slides periodically and they came from you. And I hope that makes this talk more uh, direct and, and helpful. So this will be in two parts. I'll talk about housing intervention as intervention, um, uh, some information coming from the book that I edited of the same name. And then I'll present some of my own speculative work, uh, a recent group project called Aging Against the Machine that will give an idea of how I've tried to work with others to take some of these ideas and to put them into, in this case, speculative practice. Okay. Housing and its intervention architecture towards social equity. So, um, as Austin mentioned, this is a this is a book that I had the pleasure of editing a couple of years ago. Um, it's a collection of seventeen essays from around the world, 
And so I guess the uh, primary question is why housing of all of the different ways So we might work as architects, other professions and as citizens toward social equity, why, why housing? Um, and for me, it's because of its primary position in, in so many forums, right? It's, it's, if we're lucky enough to be housed, it's where we spend the most of our time, you know, our, our lives, the primary position in our economies. We know that if the housing market crashes, the whole economy crashes and the primary position in the built environment. So if we want to create, as Austin was saying, more just and equitable cities, we had better uh, work on just and equitable housing. So I believe that this sort of trifecta makes housing a natural site of intervention. This is a key word in the very complex fight against systemic injustices. Of course, I am not at all claiming that it solves everything or, or that architecture even plays a primary role, but I think this is important. So one question I got is how did the idea of architecture towards social equity start for me? Um, and very briefly, you know, I went to Berkeley for undergrad and worked with a lot of professors who had um, were active in civil rights movements. Um, and so the idea of social justice through design was definitely uh, present and primary in that education. So coming out of that, I knew that I wanted to find a way through my work uh, to address these issues. And a first project that really turned me on to some of the specific ways in which architecture and housing can address social equity was when I had the opportunity um, as a pretty young person to co-found and direct um, the New Housing New York competition, which was the city's first competition for sustainable and affordable housing. And this happened at a moment when those two schools were very far apart. There were people working on affordable housing. There were people working on sustainable design. Many people believed that affordable housing should not be sustainable because it was simply too expensive. And we said, no, it, it must be both. Um, so we, long story short, organized a competition, got the support of the city. They gave us a site in the South Bronx. Um, and the winning scheme was called Via Verde, designed by Grimshaw and Datner. This is 222 units of affordable um, rental and for sale uh, housing. And I bring this up because it became a test case for you know, super green affordable housing and for something called active design. Um, basically looking at how the design of housing can contribute to residents having healthier lives. Um, and this is important in a place like the South Bronx that have seen decades of disinvestment um, and, and um, lower health outcomes than, than in the rest of the city. So thinking specifically in this case, in terms of health equity, um, looking at how architecture can play a role, you can see, um, just to mention a few things, um, even at the whole the whole building sort of acts as a gym in a way. There's there's productive, um, you know, small roof gardens. Um, there are healthy things like this is a narrower um, building than you would normally have. So you have simple but important healthy things like um, cross ventilation. Um, there's a gym in the building. There's a health clinic downstairs. Uh, so there's a series of, of interventions. So this was to society today and what are some measurements of success? Um, so, okay, so I'm just getting message that my internet connection is unstable. If you stop being able to hear me, let me know. Um, you cut out for so, about uh, 10 seconds back there. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll try again. Um, so the title of my book points toward the direction of social equity. Why is this goal relevant to society today? And what are some measurements of success? Um, so, you know, we can point to any number of massive and growing uh, inequalities measured by things like 
huge spikes in homelessness measured by um, growing um, economic inequality, um, you know, not to mention, you know, there, there are too many examples. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I've dealt through this particular piece of research um, and in my own speculative work about measurements of success. So maybe first I'll say that in inviting 17 people to develop essays for the book, we asked two questions. How can housing projects and the design processes behind them be interventions towards greater social equity? Um, and then questions for the architectural profession in the face of persistent social inequities worldwide, how can architects make a meaningful contribution? So in terms of measurement, and definitions. We know that questions of social equity are very different in different uh, countries and different cities for different projects. And so in terms of measurements and specificity, we invited uh, every author in their essay to clarify what is most pressing for them and how did they address it. So for instance, um, you know, is, is a project dealing primarily with racial justice or gender equality or economic justice or environmental justice, and then tell us how they dealt with it. So to give some room for specificity in different um, conditions. So um, to frame this a little bit, architecture for another housing crisis. So why do I have that in quotes? Of course, we are still feeling the effects 15 years later of the uh, foreclosure crisis and crash and more long-term disinvestment and demolishing of uh, public housing provision, especially in Western contexts. However, the so-called housing shortage is not something peculiar to the present. On the contrary, all oppressed classes and all periods suffer more or less uniformly from it. So we're saying um, this is actually not something new. Uh, this is something that unfortunately, you know, under capitalism, poorer people are, are dealing with a housing crisis constantly. Um, this is not a new quote. This is from our friend Frederick Engels um, from 1872. And, you know, I don't have to talk too much about this because we all know how bad the housing crisis has become now. So I just want to say, in some ways, this is not new, but in some ways it is, right? So this graph is wild and I'm sure many of us on the call are living in smaller housing, housing farther from work, you know, than we would we would like. Um, and, you know, this is from a few years ago now, but but looking at uh, examples where the, the crisis is now reaching, you know, the middle classes. I just read an article yesterday in the New York Times about a woman who's making $72,000 American but living in her car because rents have gotten so high and some other issues. Um, and, you know, here's a here's an article talking about Bel Air, a very rich um, area of Los Angeles, um, a fire that starts in a homeless encampment destroys multi-million dollar homes. OK, so why am I talking to you about these uh, rich people having an issue when there's so much else to talk about? I am mentioning this because when we look historically at moments of leaps forward in housing provision for more vulnerable residents, such as this moment at the turn of the previous century, where there were crowded and, and unhealthy conditions captured by people, most famously Jacob Brees, a photographer. So this is looking on the Lower East Side of, of Manhattan, um, you know, in this case, uh, people like Eastern European immigrants living in these unhealthy conditions. Um, and the an exciting and you know, notable response to that by the architectural community to develop a new form of a tenement. So long story short, we would probably call this an apartment today. Um, in, in that time, these, these multifamily buildings were called tenements. Um, so this doesn't look very interesting, but it was an important leap forward because you have more light and air. You would have had in this scheme probably a full build out, um, but in the new what's called a dumbbell apartment, which was the winning entry, you have light around the stair core. This is this is new, 
and you have more light because the back of the building is pulled back from the, from the back lot line. Um, and then importantly, this is not just a design innovation, it also becomes law so that tenements being built after this time have to bring in this, this kind of light and air, which of course um, leads to healthier conditions. So sometimes this is talked about as a benevolent moment where the government says, oh, poor people are, are in unhealthy conditions. You're just breaking up a little bit again, Karen. That's better. I don't know. We, yeah, sorry. I'm just going to turn off my camera in case that. Okay. Maybe this will help. Can you hear me now? If not, I will call in or something. We can hear you. Okay. If this happens again, then I will call in with my telephone. <laughs> so let me know. Okay. So, so in fact, in this moment, um, so there, there are diseases like tuberculosis that are associated with these unhealthy conditions and richer and therefore in our society, more powerful neighbors to the Lower East Side were worried that diseases would start in, in apartments like these and spread to them. So it was a moment much like ours when the housing crisis was big enough that it reached um, not just uh, poor classes, but, but more people that we saw a leap forward. Um, and that's why I think it's very important to look at these issues now to see what's possible in our moment. Also briefly, um, you know, for those who aren't in architecture, we've seen a shift uh, to supporting uh, this kind of work, uh, socially, you know, more socially engaged uh, work with our biggest prizes. So this is a project by Elemental, um, which, and that firm got the Pritzker prize, the biggest prize in our field. So how is architecture towards social equity different from the way architecture has conventionally been, been carried out? So in our research, we found three main categories where the, the practice is, is different. One is more collaborative approaches, two is new forms of housing, and three is a new kind of architect. So I'll just take you quickly through a few examples here. So collaborative approaches. Um, I'm taking you, and full disclosure, you're going to see, um, you're going to see a few. <laughs> this this particular presentation is skewed a bit toward the U.S., um, where I'm from, though the research is global. So I just want to acknowledge that, and I also want to acknowledge that you know I did not attempt to take on everything in housing globally in 17 essays. So this focuses on formal housing that might be called affordable or social or public, depending on the context. Um, so not taking on informal housing, not taking on um, supportive housing, et cetera. So going to Philadelphia, um, ISA is an excellent firm there. And I could talk about this particular project, um, Powerhouse, in normal sort of architectural ways about how beautiful it is, et cetera. It is, I think it is pretty beautiful. Um, but instead, what I'm going to do is talk to you about, I'm going to pull back the curtain and talk about a new form of collaboration instead. Um, so ISA, and this is another speculative project called Healthy Urbanism for, for Brooklyn. Um, ISA has worked with uh, public health researchers, uh, specifically Rupal Songvi and her firm um, Health by Design. And what this allows is more precision in terms of how architecture can impact health outcomes, both mental and physical, individual and collective. So for instance, one story I love is, you know, designers might think, okay, <laughs> I'm designing a new neighborhood, I'm gonna put a park in there because I know that access to open space, um, you know, helps people to lead healthier lives. But Rupal through her public health techniques can say yes, but that will only work if the park is 1.73 acres to address the, catch, the, the catchment area. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is not comprehensive, but it's an important start, I think, um, together through this collaboration. They developed a toolkit that talks about different strategies that we have as designers and specifically what might be the, um, the health outcomes that we can impact. 
Okay, so for the second one, there's, um, it says, please give insight on housing design for long lasting appearance and low maintenance. So for this other kind of example of um, collaborative uh, design, I'm gonna take us to London where, you know, after many decades um, since Thatcher of, of not producing new social housing or what might be called council housing here, um, after the crash, uh, boroughs such as Hackney and and now different boroughs across London and um, and maybe in, across the country have started developing social housing developed by um, by the government basically. So in this case, I want to talk about collaboration with residents, and this is not just a nice thing to do if you're a nice architect, this was necessary because in this case, as is true, unfortunately, um, you know, in, in a lot of my research in the United States and elsewhere, there was such bad blood between residents and the council um, that they were not speaking to each other. And, um, you know, Car Krusevich Carson has done a few projects, so it might have been for um, another one, not this, not this Muse project, but um, in other projects, they they work with residents, and in at least one case, there had been multiple architects who had tried to get the project going, and it had not because because of the social situation. So um, this is this is deep collaboration they do with with residents to help them to envision um, a future. Um, and and so again, this is very um, beautiful, but I want to talk about it responding directly to. Um, resident needs and actually happening at all because of deep resident engagement. And then talking about long lasting designs, as a New Yorker visiting this project in London, I said, oh my gosh, how did you convince your client to have these nice um, private open spaces and such quality materials, et cetera? And they said, well, we didn't have to. It was simply in the design guidelines. Um, which is not what we have in, in New York. Um, so I think thinking about, um, I have probably never seen a project that, um, you know, there might be some exceptions. Maybe I'm speaking a bit too, but investing properly in good materials and good construction and good design at the beginning and which is associated with, you know, if we have, um, government run housing where it's not the motivation is not a very quick profit um, but in this case uh, longer term thinking is made possible through the financial setup um, I think that is necessary and really important so taking us from collaborative forms of housing collaborative forms of practice to new forms of housing okay thanks so much so how do accessory dwelling units both detached and internal attached factor into the conversation on um, social equity. So accessory dwelling units might also be called granny flats. Um, you know, someone in the, in the audience can talk more about laneway houses. Um, so thinking about that. So there's um, an essay in the book by um, Dana Cuff, who is the director of the City Lab at uh, University of California, Los Angeles. And she has been doing amazing research on ADUs for a very long time at different scales. So looking at the scale of a prototype that would be super green or looking at a more urban scale, um, mapping uh, backyard homes is a project. So what we're looking at is we're imagining that the front house is owner occupied and that there is space in the backyard for the production of one or two um, uh, accessory dwelling units. So how does this relate to social equity? What we're looking at is the possibility of this producing what might be called naturally affordable housing because these are smaller um, units that are, there's, you know, there should be zero cost for the land. Um, so thinking about that and also thinking about this um, bringing in some income for the homeowners so what we can imagine is um, a scenario where um, more people are able to come into the neighborhood, uh, homeowners are, are able to stay, and you can, um, the, the theory is that you would have more of a mixed um, 
neighborhood uh, racially and economically. Um, and what's exciting is that Dana Cuff is not only an architect, she actually co-authored um, legislation that passed uh, statewide in California in 2017 to make it easier to build accessory dwelling units. And I talk about in theory because, um, you know, the, the PS on this is that it's been more complicated than thought in terms of um, whether this is truly affordable, et cetera. Um, and this is something that Dana explores um, well in her new book, Architectures of Spatial Justice. So I, I encourage you to look that up to learn more about what has happened. Um, so another question is why are we not placing more emphasis on the use of tiny homes to promote um, societal integration on all levels? Um, I want to clarify, you know, there are a lot of people who do important work on tiny homes like Mimi Zeiger. This has not been a focus of of my work um, for a few reasons, including um, some, anyway, some, some research that I've read about this. Um, but maybe I'll present uh, a, a counter proposal to this that was in the book. So spatial models for the domestic commons. So Naraj Bacha and Antra Steinmuller here are specifically talking about um, you know, not looking at micro units, not looking at tiny homes that might atomize us, but instead looking at a spatial model for the domestic commons, looking at new forms of commoning as they call it. So um, they're based in San Francisco. They do really cool research on the, the communes that have survived from the 60s um, and also presenting work from around the world, including this speculative project um, for Korea that talks about um, you know, a, a new relationship of private and public within the building and also how it might connect to the city. This is directly designed for a class of people who the authors call the precariat, who is probably a lot of the people in the room and in Toronto, unfortunately, um, who have just a precarious foothold in the city and you know, one if they're fired or something, they, they just can't afford to live there. So thinking about something that's more affordable, but a different method that is also more uh, bringing us in common. Um, a new kind of architect is the third category, thinking about how all this work might reshape practice. So I'll take you to Rwanda, to Kigali, where there are issues of rapid urbanization and also supply chain issues with a, where a lot of the construction materials are coming from abroad. Um, so Fatu DA, who has been working there for a very long time um, and a lot of capacities, um, talks about how, you know, being a so-called normal architect was not enough in her view. She saw the need for what she calls an architect slash environmental urbanist planner value chain expert. And this is a scheme that is, she calls more of a framework than actual design, um, but for um, the 8 million house, this is in local currency, it's a, it's a relatively affordable house. Importantly, designed around the process. So this can be produced with bricks that are made in small and medium local enterprises. So what this does is, yes, it's cheaper, it looks pretty nice, and it um, contributes to the local economy instead of, instead of having that money go elsewhere. Um, so, so what's amazing is I saw Fatu, uh, you know, a year ago and already, so this is a ribbon cutting in 2018, already there were thousands of these because it was open source, tons of small factories, um, sprung up and, and there are thousands of these, which is pretty amazing. Um, and then bringing it to Toronto, and I'm sure some of you in the audience can give, just as I gave a little bit of a PS for Dana Cuff's work, I'm sure some of you in the, in the audience can give a little bit of a PS for this. Um, but, you know, this is, so this is work that started at the University of Toronto um, with Graham Stewart as a student uh, at, at what is now um, Daniel. So, so doing um, research and sketching about what might be the future of um, power neighborhoods. Um, and then taking that, you know, doing that in school and then, you know, taking that and using that to work with communities and the government, et cetera, to do uh, built work with his, his firm now, um, ERA Architects. So looking at, um, you know, a, a multi-pronged strategy of um, energy efficiency, um, you know, introducing 
new uh, uses on the ground. Um, so this three-pronged approach, right? So emission reduction, um, having new kinds of programming and uh, producing new housing. So thinking about a new kind of architect in this case, being someone who doesn't necessarily wait around <laughs> for a rich developer to call, but instead produces speculative work and then works with people to see how that could be realized. So this is a big question and I invite whoever um, mentioned this uh, to, to clarify in the question and answer and I'll be glad to address it. Um, so ending this portion with a quote from David Madden or Peter Marcuse in Defense of Housing, which is a book I highly recommend. Um, the built form of housing has always been seen as a tangible visual reflection of the organization of society. It reveals the existing class structure and power relationships, um, but has also long been a vehicle for imagining alternative social order. So I think there's a lot of power there for those of us working in housing to imagine and help to realize alternative social orders. Okay, I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna sort of, since given the technical issues and the time, I'm gonna go very quickly through this and skip a little bit. But I wanted to share with you um, Aging Against the Machine, a recent speculative project that I worked on, again, to take some of these ideas of housing as intervention architecture towards social equity and see a case study of how we worked through this. And we as a big team um, working with residents and different kinds of experts, Aging Against the Machine is a proposal um, for West Oakland, California in the San Francisco Bay Area. And our thesis here is that aging is not a problem to be solved. The problem is the range of barriers, physical, social, financial, and cultural, that make it difficult to grow older with dignity and community. Um, older people in the US are often either isolated at home or subjected to institutionalized forms of care. So of course, aging is the machine. The machine here is neoliberalism and how it produces these atomized isolated conditions. So Aging Against the Machine advocates instead for alternative housing and community development scenarios for aging that open up multiple options for care, improve physical access to the city, enhance resource sharing, and strengthen community ties. Um, here's a shot of our exhibition that was in uh, New York at the Center for Architecture. So West Oakland is a historically um, and currently a black um, neighborhood, a racially diverse neighborhood um, where, you know, older residents face precarious living conditions. Um, and, you know, there, this is the effects of decades of disinvestment in social programs and the legacies of redlining. So there are, you know, really difficult conditions that people are dealing with there. And I want to emphasize the phenomenal, like amazing um, grassroots efforts that, that exist when there's a vacuum um, in, in government provision. So we were really inspired by the communal ideas of the Black Panthers, um, histories of civil rights and anti-war protests, and the Center for Independent Living, um, which is uh, really important historically in advocacy for people with disabilities. Um, more historical and archival research, I'm realizing I have to go quickly. And it's not just old stuff. Um, there's really great, excellent community development work happening now, including with local partners. Um, we started our project instead of having a normal map, we had a video walking through the neighborhood with David Peters of the Black Liberation Walking Tour, hearing from residents like Annette Miller, who has worked, she successfully saved her home from, from the banks. Um, building on, uh, the decades of work that our partner um, at Baltzi or the East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation has done, also doing some of our own community engagement, working with students. We were, we were teaching three courses at this time um, and how this manifests in the exhibition. So you see um, new interventions side by side with historical research, off the shelf um, examples. And then in the back, a series of scenes, I'm gonna take you through a few of those. Um, so, okay, so there was a question, so right, so a series of um, speculative scenarios or narratives um, alongside this work, and this is where we have the, the video of the, um, 
of the walk through the neighborhood. So briefly, how can this be funded? This is a question that we address. So I'm gonna just highlight some of my favorite themes instead of taking you through all um, seven. Um, on the side, so yeah, so briefly, <laughs> you know, looking at um, more accessible health infrastructure, um, transforming the main drag, San Pablo, so it's safer and greener, um, shared ramps, so, um, this is an example, you know, on, on the side streets, you get these smaller homes and thinking about how to introduce um, shared ramp infrastructure and what that could mean, um, connecting it to historical research from the Center for Independent Living, um, looking at possibilities for a community land trust. Um, so thinking about here, you know, talking about how is this um, funded, we included in each of the scenarios specifics on how this could be funded. So here we say, um, using city funding, credit union loans, and, and donations. Um, and then this is important. I love this question, how does social equity within the affordable housing sector and energy efficiency um, go together? Definitely housing justice and climate justice, um, and for that matter, economic and racial justice are inseparable, and this is necessary. Um, and so in this case, you know, we were really inspired by the Homes Guarantee, a U.S. A platform that says, how do we end homelessness, uh, produced by a coalition of more than a million grassroots leaders. Um, so they're looking at the production of 12 million units of green social housing across the country. We asked, what would that look like? What would it look like to end homelessness um, with green social housing in uh, West Oakland? And um, so this is about 1,600 units, and we're showing this on real sites. And we're showing what this might look like as more of a process um, that people are involved in. Um, and intergenerational housing and, um, and upgrades to people's homes uh, that are both for accessibility and, and financial. Um, a couple of more financial in terms of adding an ADU so that there'll be more income and people can stay in their homes. A couple of more images of the, um, the models we had on view to try to make this accessible. Um, so last, so someone asked, I love this question too, um, and I'm about to wrap up so we can have 10 minutes for questions. Um, someone asked, what's the difference between an urban planner and an architect? Why did you become an architect? What's the most rewarding thing about your job? I became an architect because my mom told me to. <laughs> I'm barely joking, but I was good at math and I was good at art, and my mom said, you should be an architect. Um, but it turns out it's not that simple. However, I just, I got addicted to architecture and in undergrad, I, I love um, making tangible some of our, you know, more difficult um, uh, social ideas. I, you know, we don't live in policy. We don't live in economics, even though housing, et cetera, is an economic problem. We live in architecture. And I just looked up the definition that I first found is urban and land use planners develop plans and recommend policies for managing land use, physical facilities, and associated services. So I don't deal with that. Um, I'm dealing with more uh, concrete, smaller issues. So a tiny preview, current work preview. I'm working on architecture and the right to housing across the Americas. You'll have to stay tuned to learn more. Um, we know that the right to housing internationally has seven specific aspects. I believe that architecture has an important role to play. Uh, for a couple of years, I've been convening I, I founded this group, the Right to Housing Working Group for the American Institute of Architects. We've been asking these questions in public through a free webinar series. Um, I was so honored to get um, uh, to be supported by the School of Cities this summer on the right for a, a convening on this topic in Mexico City, um, really productive gathering of, of architects and government leaders and scholars. Um, more coming out on that soon. And this builds on my Fulbright-funded work uh, in Argentina um, on similar topics. So stay tuned for that. And also, if you want more, <laughs> I'm giving a talk next Tuesday. I invite you to come, and I'll be talking more about uh, my practice and talking a little bit more about that. Um, maybe I'll put this bitly in the chat. So thank you so much. I do really, really, really want to meet you. I want to work with you. Um, and so I invite you to write to me. And just um, things are a little wild right now. So if you would write to me um, November 7th or later, then you are more likely to um, 
get a response. So thanks so much, Austin. Thanks to all of you. Um, I would love to answer questions now. Thank you so much, Karen. Yeah, we'll open the floor up to if, if anybody has any questions to ask for Karen. Whether you want to pop into the chat or maybe raise your hand and say any questions. Can I ask a question? I would love to know if no one has a question. I would love to know. You know, I said that I'm new here. Um, so I would love to know, you know, um, what, you know, who do I need to talk to? What I like, what does this make you think about locally? Um, of, you know, who I should be connecting with. Um, or what I should be learning more about in this work. So there, if you don't have any questions, I'm going to ask you one. That is a good question. I myself am not super knowledgeable on it. I'm not a, an architect in any sense. So if anybody in the chat has any suggestions. But often that's the point. It's not just architecture. It connects to other disciplines. <laughs> Something to think about. Uh, Karen, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, this is Paul Arklander. I work for Creatio, actually, a city agency. Um, oh, great. In Toronto. I'm just curious because, um, you know, I listened to a podcast recently from a spacing podcast where um, Susanna Bunce was talking, who I think is also one of your colleagues at the city of Toronto in the human geography department. So I'm just wondering if that's someone that you've connected with before, because I think there might be some overlap in sort of your areas of interest as well. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, can you put that person's name in the chat? I, um, I, what was I going to say? Yes, I need to talk with the whole geography department. There, there's a long list of people I, I, I am excited to meet. I know that there's really excellent work going on at uh, U of T's geography department. So yeah, put that, please put that person's name in the chat. And uh, okay, it's Susanna Bunce, great. Okay, so I just got a question from Ho Sung. Thanks so much. What is your advice to politicians who are espousing affordable housing, but seem to rely on others for the initiative? Um, can you say more? Do you mean private development or or what do you mean by that? Okay, maybe, okay, developers, ah, uh, yes. Developers have profit motive, yeah. So I think it's really interesting you know, I'm, I'm new to Toronto, so maybe I'll tell you a little bit about um, what I've seen in a U.S. context lately, and I'll leave it to you all to see how it applies or not. Um, you know, in the U.S., uh, affordable housing, and affordable in that case means 30% um, or less of somebody's income is typically developed by private developers and funded through something I won't go into, uh, but low-income housing tax credit. So this means that it's subsidized by the government, but in an, in an indirect way. And I think that we have seen the limits of these strategies to address the housing crisis. And we've seen that in what we all know today, right? We know that prices are out of control. We know homelessness is out of control. So we know that this is not where there, while there are really important things that are happening, really great people doing really good work within the system, we can see really clearly that the system is working well for people getting profits through housing, and it's not working well for people, all people being properly housed, right? That's sort of an understatement, right? So what's been really interesting to see is wider thinking in terms of what would work and, and more openness to more direct um, government intervention and to, um, you know, really important alternative schemes like community land trusts. I'm very excited 
maybe some of y'all will be at the Community Land Trust Symposium this Friday through Sunday at Daniel's, not produced by Daniel's, but at Daniel's, so maybe I'll see you there. Um, so, so looking at alternatives, because it hasn't been working, right? So I think the homes guarantee is so important because it's saying, this isn't working, we're just working at the edges. We need to look at a whole scale rethinking of the system. And this is not just the platform, I mean, importantly, you know, it's very important that there's this, this really clear platform that's produced by people who are closer to the issue. And um, this was picked up by some politicians who produced what was called the Green New Deal for public housing, which was similar. It was suggested at the federal level um, for 8 million units, I believe, of green public housing. Um, it didn't pass, but it's really exciting. People are talking about it. There's also, there's a new social housing authority in Seattle. There's a new pilot project in Rhode Island. Um, when I was looking through the slides, there was a push for a California housing authority. There's a push, to, we don't have the right to housing in our constitution in the states. So a push to add the right to housing to the California constitution. So this is all new. I don't believe we could have had these kinds of conversations 10 years ago. This is what I'm talking about, where the crisis has gotten so bad that we are looking at um, what I believe are better solutions. So, so I think, Ho, you're bringing up really critical points. And I think, um, I think a lot of people are looking at, you know, I don't think many people would believe that uh, there will be an entire shift. I mean, if we look at places like Vienna, you know, that are famous for their social housing, uh, private actors are involved. And I think private actors will always have, in, our, in my lifetime anyway, a really critical role. But looking at um, a bigger role for, for government, um, bigger role for direct uh, subsidy, um, growing community land trust. So I think looking at alternatives to the way that um, developer-driven affordable housing has, has worked. Okay, um, from Inam. Oh wait, do I have time for one more question, Austin? Is that okay? We're good, right? We have four minutes? Yeah. Okay, Inam, thanks so much. One of the barriers to getting social housing built is community backlash, yes, to develop proposals led by NIMBY and Banana Group. What role can architects play in addressing their concerns and countering their claims? Yes, okay. So the following thing is a bit complicated because, um, well, Maybe I just won't tell you what group it was, but <laughs> that's complicated issues. But I think, okay, um, I think there is, there are many roles um, for architects because architects can, are also people. And so we can join our community board. We can join, you know, we can, we can be part of, um, these questions. Okay, I'm gonna to have to put these in the chat. Um, Brian is asking these questions. I'll put the bit.ly in the chat. Um, so, right, okay, so what can our parents do? We are, we are people and we can, we can um, be part of these conversations. Also, I think at least, you know, it, in some places there's a lot of, um, there's an idea that affordable housing is ugly, et cetera. And I think it, it really matters. Um, uh, how how affordable housing is designed um, in terms of its reception in um, communities. And so, um, you know, it's it's unfortunate, but true that we need to, oh, thank you, Austin, you found it. Oh, wait, that one's, okay, there's a better one though. That's by my colleague. Um, uh, but yeah, so I think, um, you know, we need to think about, um, not just more vulnerable people, but also more uh, powerful people, because otherwise we're not going to get anything done. And and so I think that the design of affordable housing is really um, critical in in these um, fights against fights against uh, affordable housing. But I know also, you know, there's been a shift in consciousness. So I know, for instance, in New York, people are always asking for um, a housing that's more affordable for people in in particular neighborhoods. So I think there's a big shift, but that's how to answer that. And I'm going to copy this. This is a slightly better one for aging against the machine. Okay, and I'll stop there because I know we're at time. 
Yes, we are unfortunately at the end of our hour here, but I just want to say thank you, Karen, for your really amazing presentation, and thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, the School of Cities has a lot more um, very interesting programming coming up, so if it's interested, please visit our website. I'm just popping a link in the chat. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, thanks for your patience. Um, I do honestly want to connect with you, so I hope to hear from many of you um, on November uh, <laughs> 7th or later. Bye, everyone.